With everything you have on your plate, earning your degree online seems impossible. But at Grand Canyon University, we specialize in helping you fit a master's degree in business into your busy day. Your graduation team, led by your own GCU counselor, provides you with the personal support you need to succeed. Achieve your goals with a plan and team behind you. Find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Visit gcu.edu. A science story, huh? And I just thought, well, I figured it, wow. out. I it was like that tall. golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, welcome to the Story Clatter, where true personal stories about science help us to discover how weird and wonderful it is to exist in this world and be a human. I'm your host, Misha Gajewski, and today's episode explores that place where we're worried about someone and don't know what to do to help, but you still care, so you find yourself just checking up on them. A lot. Yeah, that feeling sucks, but we've all been there, including our first storyteller, Dave Camella. Dave is a Uganda-American storyteller who uses the stage and documentary filmmaking to tell visual stories of belonging, identity, and personal transformation. His first documentary, I'm Here For You, will be released this year. His story is recorded at our go-to spot in New York, Caveat, and I love this story so much. I laughed, I cried, and I totally related to lying to your parent to keep them from worrying about you. You're going to love this story. Here's Dave. The moment I opened my eyes, I knew something was wrong. I'm laying on my back looking up at the lights of the high school gymnasium. And my teammates and the opposing players and the ref, they're all looking down on me. Oh my God, look at his leg. What the fuck happened to his leg? Now I'm trying to see what they're all looking at, so I try to lean forward, and that's when I realized that my body was in shock. This was January 2008. I'm 15, and I am a sophomore bench warmer for the boys' varsity basketball team. And I got in the game with 40 seconds left, and I touched the ball for the first time, and I got injured. (laughs) And we're playing this away game in DC, so I get taken to the emergency room, and I'm sitting there on this hospital bed with the worst pain that I've ever felt in my life, trying to listen to this doctor as he's talking to me. And the door bursts open and my mom comes through and she says, the school called me to let me know what happened. I got here as soon as I can. And my mom is giving me a hug and she's consoling me. And the doctor takes a step back and he's watching this interaction between my mother and I. After a few moments, he comes to my mom and he puts his hand on my mom's shoulder and he says, ma'am, can I please speak to you outside? And I can't hear this conversation. I'm just looking at it through the frame, watching a busy hospital wing go on around them and the doctor's pointing back in the direction where my mom came from. My mom's shaking her head and she's pointing at me and she's looking at me in the room and she's kind of doing this. And the doctor has this look of compassionate misunderstanding. You know, he's nodding and he's trying to listen. And my mother has two face masks on and plastic gloves. And she's like adamant about getting back in there. And my mother and the doctor come back in the room and the doctor looks at me and he says, I just spoke to your mother about how risky it is for her to be in this room right now, in this hospital. She told me about her cancer, and so I'm going to tend to you quickly so you both can get out of here. And the day before, I'd call, the night before, I'd call my mom right before her third round of chemo, but I didn't know that she really wasn't supposed to walk up in a hospital like that. And we're sitting there and at 2 a.m. the doctor comes back in the room and he get, has this big envelope and he takes out my x-rays and my mother and I are looking at my right tibia bone broken in two pieces. And I had surgery after that and so I was away from boarding school for weeks and I couldn't walk so I'm sleeping on a mattress on the floor in my living room while my mother barely had any energy sleeping right next to me on the couch in our living room recovering. And eventually I went back to school But when I came home for the summer, I arrived with screws in my knee and no money for physical therapy. And because of mom's treatment, 
there was no money for our summer plans either. I was 15 and that was just the second time in my life that my grandmother, my mom's eight brothers and sisters, and my 27 first cousins <laughs> were not gonna spend the summer with us in Uganda. So it's day four of the summer and I'm walking up to my room and when I hit that fifth stair, my knee completely gives out when I fall back down. I'm five months post-surgery and I'm clutching my knee, nervous that I might never play sports again. And I limp to the kitchen computer and I opened up Google. How to rehab a surgically repaired knee. <laughs> and the next day I wake up at 7 a.m. and I'm sitting on the floor of my living room, nobody's awake, and I start doing these exercises that I researched. Then I go out for a run and I come back. And when I come back, my mom opens the door as I'm just slowing down my stride ending this run. And she says, I made breakfast, eat with me. So I'm eating breakfast with my mom, nobody else is awake. And she says, how is your knee? And without hesitation, I said, it's fine. I lied, I said, oh, there's nothing to worry about. I didn't tell her about what happened yesterday. And she says, no, 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 it's my job to worry. How's your knee? And I shrug it off because she has too much to worry about. She says, all right, tomorrow you gotta wake up at six. The sun won't be up, you'll have a cooler run. At least do that for me and I oblige. I don't want the fuss. So the next day, I wake up at six, I do my exercises, I go for a run. She made breakfast again. She asked me, hey, how's your knee? Same lie, mom, is great. And we just keep this routine up, her and I in these mornings, checking on each other. And this goes on for the summer. It's mid-July, halfway through the summer. We get up at six, do the routine. I come back, no breakfast. Go to my parents' room, no mom. Search the house, no dad. An hour later, my dad comes back and he says, get in the car. And I get in the car, and I'm in the passenger seat, and we're taking a familiar path. I know we're going to the hospital. We take a few different turns. We end up at the airport, Dallas Airport in Virginia. And my grandmother just got off this 16 hour flight from Uganda. And we wait and my aunt gets off this flight from Texas and we're in the car and nobody's saying anything. And the air is thick and they drop my brothers and I off at the house. My dad takes my grandma and my aunt to the hospital. My dad comes back at the end of the day, not saying anything. And it's like this for a few days and I'm nervous. And for the first time in my life, I opened up a journal and I said how scared I was that I might lose my mom. I was worried about whether I'd play sports again. And my dad keeps coming back at the end of the day. I don't see my grandmother and my aunt that week, but I keep getting up and I do the routine. And it's the weekend now, it's day six, it's Saturday. My dad comes back in the morning. He says, get in the car. And my brother and I, we get in the car, I'm in the passenger seat and we go to George Washington Hospital in DC. We park, we take the elevator up to the ICU. We get off on this busy hospital floor. We take a right, a left, and another right. And I'm looking at this door frame. And I know that the person I'm looking at in the door frame is my mother, but I don't recognize her. Her hair is gone. The color in her face is all washed out. She looks fragile, she looks weak. She's got those ugly hospital socks on that barely cover your feet. And the whole time I'm observing this, my feet keep moving. And once I enter that door frame, I see the silhouette of my aunt and my grandmother and a doctor. And my mother picks her head up and we lock eyes. And the moment we lock eyes, tears fall down her face and she puts her head back down. And I keep walking and I put both hands out to hug her. And just when I do that, my grandmother whispers, be gentle, be gentle. And I get to my mom and her body is shaking. She's fragile. And she just got out this 13 hour surgery fighting for her life. And I'm trying to hug her with as much love and grace as I possibly can. I don't know how to do that, I'm 15. And when I hug her, our faces are touching and the tears from her face are rolling down my eyes. And she's hyperventilating because she's looking for words that she doesn't have. Her body can't give her that strength. And I say, mom, it's okay. And when I say that, the fingertips, her fingertips just tuck my shirt ever so slightly. And she's trying to muster some strength to find the words. And she says, how's your knee? Tell me your knee's okay. And I lie again, I said, mom, it's okay, it's, not, it's fine. 
You don't gotta worry. I wasn't gonna say anything in that moment. <laughs> and my grandmother, she stays the rest of the summer to help my mom get back on her feet. And my mom's not always at breakfast, but preseason soccer is coming and I have to make sure my knee is ready so I'm up at six, I keep doing the thing. And I'm a junior back at boarding school now. And it's a cold, late November day. And around 3.30 p.m., I get a call, it's my mom. And she says, your dad told me you're playing in the state championship game. Because I'm sick, I'm not gonna stand out in the cold. I will not be there, but I'm wishing you luck and telling you that I'm with you in spirit. And I say, mom, that's how it should be. You shouldn't be out there. I got it from here, I'll call you after the game. And we hang up, drive two and a half hours down to Virginia Commonwealth University. We're playing the state championship game in the arena. And the Star Spangled Banner is playing and the lights are flashing through the whole space. And I open my eyes and I'm looking at the top of the arena in, in, in the back. And with two masks on, gloves, and a blanket. It's my mom waving like this. <laughs> and the first thought I had was like, oh, she shouldn't be here. Why is she so worried she shouldn't be here? And I just play the game. And the game is long. It goes into double overtime, and double overtime happens, and I see my mom sneaking into the car to heat up. And the game resumes, and she comes back out, and we win the game. It's long, it goes into PKs. I score one of the winning goals. <laughs> and we win that game. We're cheering. We have championship shirts on. I have a medal around my neck. I see my mom slowly making her way down the bleachers. And she comes and she gives me this hug. It's a long hug. And she says, I just had to see for myself how your knee is. <laughs> and I say, Mom, I know you're sick, but I'm so glad you came. And my knee has never felt better. And for the first time in 10 months, I didn't have to lie. Thank you. That was Dave. To learn more about him or his work, visit our website, storyclatter.org. Being a storyteller on our stage is just one way to make Story Collider happen, but if standing alone in the spotlight in front of an audience doesn't speak to you, maybe becoming a Story Collider donor might be more your speed. Story Collider donors play a vital role in our ability to bring you this podcast. We're in this together. Story Collider is one big experiment that's designed to connect us around our love of discovery, curiosity, and the natural world. If you believe in the power these stories have and this mission, please donate to the Story Collider at storyclatter.org slash donate. The most popular level is $10 a month, and you can make your tax-deductible donation at storyclatter.org slash donate. But really, any level makes a difference, and we're so grateful to everyone who supports Story Collider. Misha here. If you enjoy our episodes on career pathways in healthcare or the STEM field at large, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, the same team behind the acclaimed A16Z podcast. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with venture capital investors and A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. So whether you're interested in building a new digital healthcare company or your company is advancing a new novel medicine, Raising Health sheds light on some of the opportunities and obstacles along the founder's journey. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights, actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy and AI expert and in situ CEO Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. Our next story is from Dion Monsanto. Dion is a best-selling author, speaker, and holistic wellness coach and suicide prevention advocate. Her story was also recorded at Caveat in New York. Dion's story is so powerful and explores the powerlessness that parents feel when their child is suffering from mental illness. Because Dion is a suicide prevention advocate, she has intentionally followed best practices for publicly communicating about suicide and telling her story. That being said, I want to let you know that this story does include mentions of suicide, self-harm, and child sexual abuse. In case you'd find them helpful, now or at any point in the future, we have some resources available on our website. 
Head to storyclatter.org for tips on serving as a first responder, making a suicide safety plan for a loved one or for yourself, community-based solutions for suicide intervention, and more. Here's Dion. I'm a great mother. Siwe, my daughter, short for Afuya Pili Busisiwe Ayo Monsanto. Brilliant girl. She was published in English, Spanish, a dancer, an author. This girl could do anything. She could write that whole name at four years old. I should have known that was the case when she was born exactly on her due date. That girl was so smart, I used to tell people I was gonna wind up working for her someday. During my career at Morgan Stanley, I was blessed to work three blocks away from their school. And that meant I got to show up for bake sales. I got to do all the things like parent committees. It was awesome. I needed to be the sort of parent that my mom was that showed up all the time, even if I was working full time. My daughter and I, we were overachievers. We were making names for ourselves, me in financial services, her in school. So now we look at this kid and she's like, huh. She would tell you things, she would read things on the train. She was too smart for her own good. I looked at this one and I was like, oh, what a blessing. But the mood swings. Do you remember the times when there was only one PC in the house? She came home in a panic. She had a homework assignment and she needed the computer now. But my older son was on the computer. A fight was going to ensue. So it's like, well, when is your project due? In two weeks. Uh, his homework is due tomorrow. You need to wait. She was not having it. She was inconsolable. And then came the tears, like waterworks for 45 minutes at least. Situations like this were fairly common in our house. So I was actually relieved when she was diagnosed with depression and anxiety disorder. They are tried and tested remedies for that. There's therapy. I mean, with the DSM-5, if you answer five out of nine questions in a certain way, considering you have symptoms for a prolonged period of time, you get a diagnosis. So this also meant we weren't alone. Other people were dealing with this. And it also felt good that they said that this was fairly common as a diagnosis for highly gifted and talented children. What do we do? Therapy. Great. When was I going to fit therapy in our already overpacked schedule? And she leaves for camp next week. OK. To say I was stretched thin is an understatement. Working at Morgan Stanley, three kids, a landlord, a house, dating. But I come from a long line of we can and we do women. No excuses. We'll figure it out. Fast forward, with the support of family and friends, I'm thankful, and Paul and I, her father, we were co-parenting well together. This weekend, his weekend, I get a call. D, have you seen Siwe? Uh, it's your weekend, sir? No. Well, she ran off. Pardon? She, well, we were talking about some things. We were talking about some things, and there's this boy she really likes at school, and I just didn't want her first experience to be with some knucklehead who didn't care about her. So I fondled her. I was driving, I hit something, and I yell, what? Are you saying that you had sex with our daughter? Oh no, nothing like that. I kind of park. I'm a little dizzy at this point, and I realize I probably should not be driving while I have this conversation. And Paul, I don't know what's wrong with you, and I don't know what the cops are gonna do when they catch hold of you, but I've gotta find my daughter. Back in church, they try to help me process what I had just heard. We make calls, and calls, and calls, and finally, a man answers her cell phone. He assures me, this police officer, 
that my daughter is okay. She's at New York Presbyterian Hospital. Okay, thank you, sir. I'm in Queens, I am in my car, I'll, I, I will get there as fast as I can. Traumatized and tearful, I get to New York Presbyterian. I walk in and I'm greeted by police officers and ACS, the Agency of Child Services. I'm in a daze. I'm like, I just wanna see Seaway. Where is my child? What happened? They tell me, that I have to calm down and I have to be strong for her. I pull it together. And once I've pulled it together, we go see her. Siway is curled up in a ball. She's wearing pink pajamas and pink track shoes. She's embarrassed and ashamed at 11 years old. Paul was a good father until he was not. And a piece of my daughter died that day. It was a Sunday, she had school on Monday, and she just wanted her book bag. She'd done her homework. Our lives became a series of appointments. Assistant District Attorney's Office, Agency of Child Services, Victim Services, Her Therapy. And I still had that job, three kids, house, landlord. I was overwhelmed and I ate my stress. I easily gained 80 pounds. But Seaway, she didn't have any place to put her stress. So she started to harm herself. She was dealing with PTSD, PMDD, depression and anxiety. So she became a cutter. I had been a stranger to mental illness until this point, we were besties. We were intimately acquainted. Paul was sentenced to five years in jail. We felt safe. We move on with life. We learn her triggers. We're in school, we're traveling, we're performing. We're getting back to our new norm and I get a call. Seaway had attempted suicide? I cannot share the method of her attempt as that is not safe messaging with suicide awareness and prevention. But for three weeks, we visited the pediatric psych ward as a family. We did homework, we had dinner, and we played games. This was our new norm. It was a daily thing. When they released her from the hospital, they told me I needed to sanitize my house. What? My house is clean? What they mean is you need to remove anything and everything that she could possibly kill herself with. Whew. I live in a house. I've got a backyard. There's gardening tools. There's cleaning supplies. There's over-the-counter medication. There's kitchen knives. I mean, well, that began our lives of 24-hour suicide watch. I could not have done that without my family and my friends. Well, one life, one year, one week led to several years, several weeks. And one suicide attempt led to another suicide attempt, led to another suicide attempt, until she ultimately died by suicide on Wednesday, June 29th, 2011. My Seaway was gone. I had found yoga after a near deadly case of pneumonia and I was thankful for my yoga mat. 
I couldn't do a lot of things, but I could show up on my mat and I had this rectangle of peace where nobody was asking me questions. Nobody asked, why? What happened? Why? Why would she kill herself? There is no one reason that anyone takes their own life. I didn't have the answers. And there were so many questions. And the majority of people that have a mental illness, they don't even die by suicide. And less than one third of the people that do are in treatment at the time of their death. This was not supposed to be my story. I was grieving. I was recovering from pneumonia. I have my two sons to raise and there were so many things I could not do. But I could continue to show up on my mat. I could do yoga every day and have my peace because I come from a long line of we can and we do women. No excuses. Back at work, I realized I kind of didn't fit in anymore. Financial services, I had changed and it had not. And with the help of my therapist, I left. I left and I became a Bikram yoga teacher. I now live a life fueled by passion, purpose, and joy. I wrote a book, I'm an author, I coach, I speak, I teach yoga, and I teach dance. I'm happy. I even got to work for the Seaway Project, a nonprofit named after my girl. Life manifested a way for me to work for that child. Everyone that knows me knows I have three children, even though my girl is deceased. Seaway lives. Seaway lives on through me. The me I am today was born because of my loss. Death is a reminder for the living to live. That was Dion. If you'd like to learn more about her or would like access to suicide prevention resources, visit our website, storyclatter.org. Our website is just one way to connect with Story Clatter, but there are so many other ways, and we hope you'll use all of them. You can always follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Head to storyclatter.org to become a financial supporter, or if you want to come to one of our shows or want to start your own Story Collider show in your community, you can learn all about that on our website, too. This podcast is produced by me, Misha Gajewski, along with Nikisha Roberts-Washington, Jen Chen, and Aaron Barker, executive director and co-founder of The Story Collider. The stories featured in today's episode were produced by Christine Gentry and Paula Croxon. Special thanks goes out to Story Collider's board and staff, including Anne-Marie Lonsdale, Leslie Bernson, and Lindsay Cooper. Our theme music is by Ghost. And next week, I'll be back with stories that dive into those precious memories we hold dear. They're incredible stories, and you don't want to miss them. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Pulling up to Mickey D's just for drinks? Oh yeah, that's me. Nothing extra, just perfection and a straw. Coming in hot for the coldest cups on the block. Because there are drinks. Then there are drinks from McDonald's. Mix things up with any size lemonade or sweet tea for $1.49. Perfect with our classic fries. Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba.